Okay, we have about 30 minutes left for this session, and if I know this room, there'll soon be a line at the uh, microphone, but I'm the moderator, so I get to go first with some questions. And I want to thank Hector and Jessica for specifically mentioning the, um, the decision aid. So I've got two general questions, and the first is going to center around this decision aid, um, and then the second I'm going to go a little bit broader. Um, but uh, So Hector, you showed in your study how you sort of walked through the decision aid and how it actually was helpful to make sure that you're addressing the fundamental critical components. But Jessica uh, mentioned, well, it might be overly simplistic. We know a lot about doing really good observational designs in their um, and comments from Hang on uh, CDRH has a lot of experience in using observational designs and interesting methods for improving those. Um, and Jessica talked about, well, there, there are lots of things within research design itself, new user design, um, making sure that we're doing that sensitivity analyses, that we're not falling to the pitfalls of observational design. So I, I submit that we, we know how to do um, really good observational designs, and perhaps the, uh, the decision aid is a bit overly simplistic, but I'm not sure. So that's the question to the uh, panelists. Uh, regarding the decision aid itself, is it, um, you know, how useful is it? Does it need to get more detailed into the research design, or is it a good framework that might guide uh, uh, the development of future studies that could be subject to um, is supporting a regulatory decision. Um, I, I, we don't have to go in order, but if, if any of you have a thought or comment to say, go ahead and uh, raise your hand and let me know you're going to go. Okay, Mark. Sure. Yeah. Um, oops. Yes, I would say this uh, user guide is very much tailored to a very specific method and a very specific question. Uh, so in this case, it's as if the only method we should be considering is propensity score matching or weighting, which is going after the effect among the treated. So you're asking the question, if I enforce my population to always treat, people come in, treat, versus people come in, don't treat, that that contrast is the question of interest. Now, even when that would be the question of interest, this isn't, this isn't particular method, it's non-robust, it's non-efficient. There's theory which actually suggests efficient methods. So there's no reason to be married to this method. We can do better. It still will rely on machine learning, or at least you have to tell me how you estimate that propensity score. Very important question. You can say, oh yeah, I'm just doing a paramedic model. We have thousands of covariates. Why only main terms? Why not two-way interactions? So these are all crucial uh, questions. But I would also argue, again, that many times the question of interest is not an average treatment effect. Right? For example, I've been looking at a study on the effect of, uh, uh, let's say, steroids on sepsis. 30 randomized trials have been done. None had a, comp had a convincing answer. Why? Because when we reanalyzed, it appeared that depending on the stress test, for if you had, or had a positive response on the stress test, it was bad for you, and the other ones, it was very good for you. If you actually look at the rule, like we learned the optimal rule, which we can do from these studies, and therefore treat in response to these characteristics which you measure at baseline, then you get a very strong effect and it is very important to use steroids at least for that particular group. So you can focus for 30 randomized trials on the wrong question simply uh, thereby not even allowing to have any power but also answering the wrong question. And so there are many exciting, that's why you have to sit down and ask what is the question of interest. Many times when you talk to medical doctors they will not care about the static. I mean, they might be brainwashed by thinking Cox or whatever is the only answer. But many times when you talk to them, they say, of course, I, I, I'm following a particular rule. I'm caring about contrasting this rule, which says, when you have this biomarker, should I already start intensifying treatment for diabetes patients at this level or at that level? These are the kind of questions they might ask. These are very different questions than an average treatment effect. So this is not addressing all the complexities of uh, the real world, even in randomized trials. Even in randomized trial, the world is much more complex. Great, thanks. Um, so, uh, Javier, or, or, or thoughts from you on the no, I will usefulness say that, of the aid? Yes, I, I tend to agree with the fact that uh, I will say trying to limit just to have the average uh, effect is probably a, a limitation. I will say that it's useful to have an, uh, some, uh, some of this information already, and 
try to be as simple as possible if you really want to make sure that it can be implemented. But then probably adding with particular opportunities through linking with publication or other opportunities for additional information on how to do a proper uh, design and how to use other uh, technology and other uh, opportunities when you are trying to answer different questions. Um, so Jessica, let me turn back to you on that, on that question. You said it was simplistic, but it does sort of fit into, uh, you outlined your publication around, you know, when to, when observational designs can, um, can, um, you know, be used outside or instead of uh, randomized control trials, but you actually, and you showed it actually how you are operationalizing, you kind of did follow the uh, decision aid. The decision aid's a bit silent on the research design characteristics itself. Um, but that's okay. So how do you think this is uh, going in the right direction? Yeah, I mean, I think when I, I think you're exactly right. When I showed kind of the, the model that we're using for implementing our studies, it does fit pretty well with the decision aid. I think in part because the kinds of questions um, that we are answering when we replicate these 30 randomized trials actually fit quite well with the type of questions that I think, um, you know, the, uh, the people had in mind when they were writing this decision aid. Um, so, I mean, I think I, I agree with Mark also that, you know, it's hard to tell people exactly what to do. It depends on the clinical question. You know, there's, we all know, enough variety out there that if you try to say always use this method, you know, there's all, you're going to have 10 examples where it doesn't fit and doesn't make sense. Um, but I do think telling people a few things that they really should not be doing, because, you know, as I showed, it's a real, you know, when people think about why do we not trust observational studies, to me, a lot of it is because people are making avoidable design mistakes over and over and over again. And so when I worked on that project where we um, you know, actually evaluated how often it's happening, it was really eye-opening for me because I had only ever worked you know, in uh, pharmacoepi at Harvard, which I think is you know, arguably one of the best places in the world to do that. And I was used to kind of seeing the way my colleagues did things, which I think you know, are very good and, and very thoughtful. And it was very eye-opening for me to see you know, what was out there in the literature. And so I think um, <coughs> if we can just tell, get people to stop doing these things, we're 50% you know, of the way there. Great, thanks. Um, so now I'll turn to, so going a, a bit, okay. Uh, so we got the line starting. Let me get my, my, my n next question out and, and then we'll turn to the, um, uh, just going be broader than the uh, decision aid itself, it helps us like to get to a really good observational study. Uh, so then what? How do we know that it's useful or can support a regulatory decision? How do we know that it's rising to the level of substantial evidence? Um, and I suspect the answer goes into, well, it depends on other factors. And I want to get your thoughts on what should those other factors be? And how can we know that a really well done observational study or set of studies can actually support uh, a regulatory decision. Um, I think those factors are um, what's already known about the condition. Is it a chronic disease? Is it a rare disease? Um, is there significant levels of unmet need? Um, um, what do we already know, know about the drug itself in terms of its benefit risk profile? Has it been on the market for a long time and we're really confident um, in the, uh, the, the safety and effectiveness versus, you know, has it not been on the market for that long and do we know little beyond the, um, the trials that were used to support uh, marketing? Uh, what's the expected treatment effect? Is it really big or really small? And that might give rise to whether or not the observational design uh, or set of designs might uh, come in. And then what I think is most important is um, the specific regulatory question at hand. Is it a, a, a new indication of a brand new population? Or is it a question about revising the label with additional safety information or anything in between? Um, how, do, how do these factors grapple with or sort of work with whether or not these really well done observational designs can in fact be supportive of, of, the, of, of the given regulatory decision? Um, any? Uh, oh, Hector knows. Okay. Uh, I I will uh, deviate a little. Sorry. I will deviate a little bit, and uh, I will start with this uh, question that uh, Javier presented. We have biology, we have behavior, we have healthcare practice. Uh, so if I have a let's say a decent study, and I want to say which one of the outcomes I want to use the most. I will try to get rid of the problem of behavior because it confounds me a lot. 
I will try to get rid of the healthcare practice confounder, and I will try to stay with the biology. How, how do we do that? And I will be completely oversimplistic. Uh, there is one way in which we get help, which is uh, observational studies are particularly useful for rare events. The advantage we have is that uh, rare events are often hospitalized. When you have a condition that is systematically hospitalized, you decrease the health care provider practice behavior. You also increase the amount of information you have. Interestingly, very interestingly, in the studies I have not presented to you, uh, we are trying to show that, in fact, the health care seeking behaviors are much less of a problem when you have something that is so severe that you have only two options, or you go to the doctor or you go to the doctor. Therefore, uh, <laughs> one. <laughs> uh, therefore, I think we have to take into account those considerations. Assuming you have the same quality of the data set, you did everything perfect, whether you use propensity scores or not, who do you trust more? The fact that the physician saw the patient in the outpatient, that the patient went to the outpatient to see the physician, or that this, this serious disease was hospitalized, you have more complete data. So if I have nothing else, and if I can do nothing else than trust this data, I would be more likely to trust data from serious events that are hospitalized. Okay, thank you. Um, any others? I just say, you know, I think you're absolutely right, and I think this was, you know, the answer to some of the questions um, that we had uh, a discussion yesterday as well, and that, you know, I think it depends, um, and I think it's one of those uh, items that we really have to uh, take into account that this really should be um, considered on a case-by-case -case basis, you know, um, looking at the risk uh, of uh, actually uh, drawing the wrong conclusions. You know, are we dealing with a serious, uh, potentially fatal, life-threatening illness, or is this something uh, more common where if we actually are incorrect in our assumptions or that there's um, not necessarily much morbidity or mortality that, that comes with these uh, decisions. Um, and, and I think also, you know, it depends on the context of, of the product and where it is in development. You know, is the, the data that we, if there's already an approval for this product and, and are we extending <laughs> the indication in the same disease setting, you know, just adding a, uh, looking at a later line or an earlier line, or is this an entirely different disease and how much um, confidence uh, do we have just in the uh, extrapolations from the data that we already know um, and the safety and effectiveness to this um, uh, new setting. So I think it really is uh, needs to be considered on a case-by-case -case basis. And I think that sort of, uh, again, goes back to my other earlier point, which is that I think um, interacting with the agency early, very early in this stage, even at the, you know, when first considering the idea of uh, embarking on this, uh, I think is really uh, something I would encourage. <laughs> I think there's an RWE email. I don't. I didn't see that uh, for the FDA. Um, uh, so uh, okay, thanks. Any other comments or? Yes, it's probably just uh, to add uh, to the point. Uh, on top of the the risk of the decision that you take on that is also even what are the uh, the ethical consideration about trying to do a clinical trial instead of the real world evidence study and from all point of view is uh, even on the possibility and the feasibility of the clinical trial or to include people into a uh, comparator group without the intervention and even the time that take to delay the decision and the amount of people that will not benefit from that potential uh, uh, intervention until you deliver the clinical trial. Thanks. Oh, okay, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> so why is there distrust of observational data? because there are well-known cases where the data from observational studies has not matched up with RCTs, probably the most famous being hormone replacement therapy and does it provide cardiovascular benefit or not. Um, and that's why what Jessica and Sebastian are going to do is so important. Let's point out that the Cochrane Collaboration published a meta-analysis a couple of years ago that said in the vast majority of cases, where you've been able to do an observational study that mimics an RCT, the results come out pretty similar. So what Jessica and Sebastian and the FDA is going to do now is going to do that over again, but instead of a meta-analysis, you're doing it prospectively, the data is better, the methods are better, and we'll get a better estimate of that. So let's just assume 
that the results are going to come out similar to the Cochrane collaboration. In most, if not all cases, where you can replicate an RCT, it will be similar. So what do we do with that? Because it's not about replicating an RCT. What we've recommended in our ISPOR guidelines is that if you can replicate an RCT of a data set, in a data set, then you know you have a fit for purpose data set. So if you have a data set and you can replicate the RCT, now you say, look, I replicated the RCT. Now I'm going to do other analyses to look at the more general population. And you might have more confidence in that information. That's one way to bridge. I don't, there's a lot of discussion about that. We've had discussion at Duke Margolis about that. No one wants that to be an absolute standard that you must be able to replicate because in many cases you can't replicate an RCT out of an, obs out of an observational data set. But if you can and you get a result that is substantially similar, whatever you think that means, well then other analyses you do off of that data set should be more credible and I would say would be good enough for regulatory decision making. Okay, thanks, Mark. Uh, any disagreements uh, among the panel? No, okay. Uh, <laughs> Greg? So um, I want to come back to one thing. I thought I heard sort of a contrast among the speakers, but when I thought about it more, maybe it's less of a contrast, so let me try this out. It was this question about, you know, when we're establishing our methods to account for confounding, on the one hand, we, we hear this should be done without looking at the, uh, you know, the question of interest. Um, even without even access to data regarding the outcomes because we need to keep ourselves honest. And Mark sort of said, well, why would you do that? Because you're handicapping yourself in terms of optimally understanding the relationship in this feature space. But I, if I understand the methods you're talking about, Mark, in some ways that estimand is still hidden to you during the early stages of that process. Essentially, the estimand of interest is swimming in a large group of other relationships that you are allowing or you are attempting to optimally manage, and only once you have sort of allowed those relationships to play out through various machine learning methods, do you then shine a light on the estimand of interest and say, now I can look at that. So if I'm understanding, we're still hiding, uh, in, one, in, on, in, one, in one case, we are hiding that estimand of interest while human beings make decisions. In the other, on the other case, that estimand is swimming in things while machines make decisions, and then only in this later step do we call it out. Or am I understanding you correctly? Uh, no, <laughs> uh, but uh, you're hitting some good points. Uh, so the estimate. <laughs> The estimate is not hidden. Uh, it is one of the first important things you do in the part of the roadmap. You define the estimate, which represents the closest answer to your causal question of interest. So that estimate, we know exactly what it is, whatever it is. It might be an average treatment effect. So the question is, how do you learn from the data that estimate? Now, there, there's a, there has been a history which has been saying, you know, uh, when you uh, do these kind of methods using propensity scores, uh, just uh, fit the propensity score, don't look at the data, and, and, and uh, don't look at the outcome, right? And then finally, once you have that, you can run your, uh, your, your estimator. Now, that is, uh, the idea of that was, you know, I don't want you to start messing around with trying many things. This is one of the biggest problems in observational studies, why, you know, many publications based on observational studies are simply a joke. People are not a priori specifying, they are, they are trying out all kinds of things uh, till they find essentially what they want. If you tell people that they do that, they don't even deny it, okay? <laughs> so what we, are, uh, what we are saying is, we sh in a way, you cannot blame these people, right? Because if you use a simple thing like a logistic regression or Cox project has it with thousands of covariates, how are you going to figure out which one to choose? So of course, your a priori specified one will never work. That's why we need to build machines, which is going to do a priori specified according to an algorithm is going to do what you like to do as a human being. So this algorithm will try out many, many things, and in particular will include heavily adaptive machine learning algorithms. But it's all a priori specified. It's like, you know, the data, run it, and let it do its job. And when you accept that, so now there's no fooling around anymore, then you can show, and also 
both practically as well as theoretically, that you should be using uh, when you use FIT, for example, as part of the procedure, the propensity score. You should be using the outcome to tune that propensity score for the purpose of what you're trying to learn. Because as we say, you can make pictures of balanced uh, after propensity score matching. If you, if you don't even look at the outcome, you might be matching on variables which are very predictive of the treatment, but have hardly anything to do with the outcome. They are really irrelevant, right? So we are looking at the wrong picture. So these methods are far superior, the methods I was talking about, by actually a priori specified, let the data really figure out how to do it and optimize your precision. I just, I just want to respond that I think, um, I think Mark's methods are not um, incompatible with the, with the implementation model that I had described because I think, you know, the idea was you, uh, you develop your protocol and your statistical analysis plan that can pre-specify, for example, these types of methods that use the outcome to decide, uh, for example, what covariates to adjust for. Um, I think as long as you can pre-specify it, you know, that can be part of your uh, statistical analysis plan that you then register. Um, before you go to the analysis stage. So I think that um, those methods are not incompatible with kind of the model that we had in mind. Uh, Luca? Uh, thank you. My question is uh, probably a follow-up on or a generalization of Greg's question, and I'm asking the panel if you could uh, comment on how do you assess significance in whatever way you want to define it on uh, uh, methods that, uh, <clears throat> that have decisions that are made by humans and decisions that are made by machines, uh, they both need to be adjusted for. Like we know that, for instance, when you use a, like a feature selection algorithm and you know, the selection of this feature needs to be somehow adjusted in the significance of the results. So when Mark is talking about machine learning methods that are doing, trying a lot of things and doing cross-validation to see which one is the best, you're still doing cross-validation on holdout sets is the same for all these methods, right? So is there a way to you know, track what is the depletion that all of this decision has on the data and, and you know, translate it into how to adjust your p-value or whatever measure you want. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, so this was one of the big challenges uh, and was the reason why we had two fields. We had classical statisticians and we had machine learning people. Classical statisticians <laughs> used parametric models and they say, I have a p-value and a confidence interval. The reality is the p-value and the confidence interval are unreliable because the models are wrong. Then the machine learning people actually say, okay, let's just let the data speak. Oh, we don't know how to get a confidence interval because it gets too hard. So this is exactly what we have been working on, working out the theory. How can you utilize the state of the art of machine learning and still get formal statistical inference? So the estimates we're talking about, which combine the super learning with targeting, they are what we say asymptotically normally distributed. So we do know how to estimate the variance and, and, and can therefore can construct confidence intervals and do formal testing. And, uh, yeah, and then in particular, there are fine and simple improvements based on a bootstrap method to make it even you know, uh, as good as possible and fine and simple. So the answer is it's a challenge, but that's exactly what we have been working on. Uh, so, so yes. Okay, uh, Denisa. So I have two comments. And, and the, uh, first I would just say that I was compelled to, to comment it because you, of the way how you ask the question, you have the results and then what? Is this is going to be good enough for particular regulatories? I think this is the, um, this question, your question should be asked first. And I think there's fitness for purpose of various methodologies and data sources. I think, and commenting on the colleague from uh, another center with CDRH, it's really about getting to uh, in touch with agency first and understanding what is the portfolio of the tools. And I know you didn't mean it that way, but I think it, this is often trap that we are facing with, where sometimes it's uh, way too late after the study is done to actually comment on the, on the pr proper ways of doing the study. But uh, my real question to the panel has to do with the totality of the evidence uh, during the entire life cycle of, of technology. In our case at CDRH, we're certainly putting a lot of emphasis into shifting the evidence from pre-market to post-market, raising the boundary between um, that artificial um, point uh, when the product actually gets it to the market. So I wanted to see um, some reflection about the uh, decision tool and uh, an ability to actually uh, do this uh, pre-post-market balance in a proper way as we are not now, as we're now finalizing the tool, uh, if you could comment on that. Um, well, I'll let the, uh, any panelists comment on that, but I completely agree with you, Denitza, that in, in, as I'm thinking about the, um, this decision tool, there seems to be that there needs to be some earlier step that actually gets, Denitza, to what you're talking about. Um, 
if you presume that a company or a sponsor is going to interact with the FDA early enough in the process to sort of talk about what that observational design or set of studies might look like, I would presume that in that discussion would include what do we already know about the product, what are we, um, what are we trying to answer, can an observational design actually help um, address those gaps. So there's some step that you're saying um, that is used to, um, to know, are, are, are the stars aligned or are, are, is there some sort of alignment here that actually can help guide how we design that study or, or, or what the research design should be. Um, um, and, I, and I think it might be a, it's a box, but it'd be a pretty easy step to put in the, in, in the decision aid because I think it does get to um, forcing that researcher to say, okay, well, it really does matter what we already know about this product and what our concerns are, what's our risk of getting it wrong, what, you know, what's the real context that we're trying to address here. But curious, the rest of the panel, on how you see that maybe fitting in here. Odds or, yeah. No, I will say that I fully agree. I think that the point is about the early interaction and the agreement on the, the way to deliver the, the studies and, uh, and the opportunity to even to work together through the, the analysis to make sure that there is full transparency in uh, how the, uh, the project is done. I think that this is, uh, this is a clear one. The, probably the question will be is uh, the availability of resources for that. As more data is being available, more studies are going to, to happen and be delivered. And the point also that probably is uh, not only pre-post, but even after the post-commercialization, this new environment it will be probably more a continuous evaluation with continuous assessment of the benefit risk value of the product in real life. Okay, uh, one last uh, question. I wanted to obtain the panel's perspective on specific unmedicated founders in a specific area. So we were asked to think more rigorously about unmedicated founders. We were asked to, we saw an example of mixed methods researchers being used to try to supplement it and give additional understanding on unmedicated founders. And we also had a highlighting of the thou shall nots with a focus on one error that happens a lot, adjusting for causal intermediaries. And within that conversation, I thought immediately about race. You know, if you're familiar with the work of Nancy Kruger at Harvard or Dor Dorothy Roberts talking about the challenges of looking at race as a biological construct, we know that there are a lot of unscientific and ideological underpinnings to that. And so I wanted to know, did you have any examples of how this has been dealt with in a more scientifically robust way? And I also want to give a recommendation at the decision age that at some point really encourage all of these activities to begin with a strong conceptual model and a theoretical framework that might help researchers think about things instead of just kind of putting in race as an adjustment, when it could actually be something that is more of an interaction or something that has to do in other contexts. So thank you for your perspective on that. Yeah, great. Uh, uh, great point. And uh, uh, any thoughts from that? I know, Hector, you looked at, you know, you at least had some additional data from the MCBS survey, but then other data sources to try to get to um, some of those measures. But uh, any, any additional thoughts or comments based on the yeah, it, point? Yeah, it's a, it's a very interesting uh, issue. Uh, we cannot disregard race and how it interacts with many other things, including socioeconomic conditions, level of education, and also behaviors, you know, going to the doctor behavior. Uh, but so race by itself is just one of the covariates you have to analyze to understand how the individual will behave. It's, it's very complicated. We can discuss it afterwards, but it would take hours. Yeah, it's very important. Okay, uh, that brings us exactly to the end of the session. I'm told that uh, um, we're going to go to break now, come back at 10.15, but I would like to thank all of our presenters and uh, panelists. It was a great discussion. Thank you.